I, I think what you're doing is, is a marvelous thing. So, um, always, always lovely to, to jump on a, on a, uh, what do we call this? A webinar, a broadcaster, live stream? The what the hell is it? it, it hey, it, you could call it any of those things is the kind of, <laughs> right? Um, um, so my history is obviously I've still got this very strong British accent. So I'm from England originally. Um, I came over here, uh, in, to the United States, to California. Um, when I was still in the music business, I did all the ooch, 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 house music, um, back in the nineties. And I did that in the UK as well. And I, I was very, uh, very successful at it and very, I, I had a bunch of hits. And then right around the, uh, the turn of the century, I was like, I'd been in it a long time. I dropped out of high school at 15 and went off to do records, uh, produced my first record at 17, and then had a string of hits all the way to my early 30s. And then I'm like, ah, okay, that was fun. Let's do something else. So um, I retired from uh, the music business with a number one in 12 countries in, in, in the dance charts. And I'm like, okay. And I was like, where do you go from here? I'm like, I'm probably never going to have that again. So I'm going <laughs> to get out on the top floor. So I got out on the top floor and, and I, I don't really know where this next uh, idea came from. But I, my mom lived in England at the time. My brother lives in Australia. And I saw house prices compared to LA. And I'm like, hmm, house prices are really cheap in LA compared to England and Australia. And this thing called the internet means a lot of people are gonna wanna live here, I think. So I started pushing money into, uh, all the money I made from music, I pushed into flipping into houses in these areas where everybody said I was bonkers to invest. Um, and, um, and then my wife and I, uh, we, we were just dating at the time, but we then started you know, investing in these kind of crazy outlandish areas. And then I'm happy to say that this little that little gut inside, my gut said, you know what, this is getting too frothy. You need to take the money out of property. And we took it out of property and pushed it into Google and into Apple and into Netflix. So it was, uh, and I never left, left real estate. I, 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 I joined real estate as a black sheep. I was a creative. <laughs> and I'm like, where am I, man? This is, this is like working in a bank. Um, <laughs> Well, it's like, it's like time travel and to some extent of yeah. like, you go back. And I, I think honestly, like to me, that's always been sort of your secret sauce is you don't see the way things are and take them as they are. You're willing to sort of challenge that status quo and, and bring your creative genius to real estate. Wow. Creative genius. I'll take it. <laughs> um, so I think, you know, I, I'd like to, I, I would love to kind of sit here and say how fabulous I am at predicting things. I, I actually have the music business to thank for it. And I'll tell you why. When you work in electronic music, it is the fastest changing music out there. Like rock bands, because there's a, a band and a singer and drummer and bass, and there are people, right? It, it's a lot more, dare I say, formatted. And I don't mean that in a bad way. But it's, it's a rock band, right? Whereas electronic music, especially club music, is anonymous, hmm. right? You very rarely see what the artist looks like. Um, and it is driven by what is occurring in technology, the new sounds that come out every single week. And so I was obsessive. I would go through, I would go to record stores and I would go through all of the records every week to try and predict where dance floors would be in six months to a year. And then when I joined real estate, I'm like, ooh, that muscle will never come in handy again. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's absolutely been my, my touchstone that has, uh, has allowed me to, to, to leap and land where the market will get to. No, I 100% I, I think that that's the truth. And I, I mean, I know you well enough to know that you're not going to pat yourself on the back. So for, for those of you guys who don't know much about Peter, so Peter, when he started in real estate, was the number one agent in his Keller Williams brokerage. He was the rookie of the year. He then, for the next three years, became the number one agent at that KW brokerage. And then in 2009, was the number one agent in the LA market. Now, that is not an easy feat 
to to <laughs> achieve. And so he can joke that he got out on the top floor and wasn't going to experience that level of success. But I would argue that that, that kind of drive and, and creativeness that you brought to real estate is a lot of why you were able to to achieve that. So you after you had had all of this tremendous success both in music and in in real estate sales you kind of you decided to launch your own brokerage uh plg yes. states um yes and i love the way you describe your brokerage and i am um a, a fan of indies at my core it's always been my love language as i joke um but I think the, the the way that you describe PLG Estates is it's a SWAT team of the best of the best. And I love that. So talk to me a little bit about why in this world where there's a million brokerages out there, why did you feel the need to create your own space? I think it was, um, so it's a, that's a, another really interesting question. It, it, it was in my DNA before I got my license. So let me kind of unwind, unpack that a little bit. So when I was a record producer, right, I had many opportunities to be in the band and I always liked to build the product. I like to build products. And so I like to create the acts and then stay in the background and kind of push them onto the stage and let them have all the glory. Um, and, and so when it came to real estate, I, I always wanted to build something that what I like looking for the white space, right? As Gary says, I like to find where things, there's always room in a very saturated market for people with ideas. And I, and I, I suppose part of it was selfish. I wanted to create a very rock and roll kind of like, you know, loud, um, strictly for creatives kind of real estate company when nobody in the industry was doing that. And so my wife, bless her, who is more than 50% of all this, um, she has always looked me in it. She's a, I married a Buddhist. So my wife was a, a Vietnam war refugee. So she's, she is, a, a, she comes from a tough background, but she's really centered. Now I'm, uh, I, I'm from the opposite kind of upbringing, but because she's so centered, she has always looked me in the eye and gone, everything is the way it's meant to be. So you just have at it, do whatever you want. And she's allowed me to go off on these harebrained schemes of, you know, setting up uh, a brokerage in the middle of Beverly Hills amongst all these big <laughs> galleons of gold. And here we are, the little punk street kids. And, um, um, and so I created PLG really for myself and and then I wanted to see if there were other agents out there with just the right amount of crazy as I call it uh who wanted to kind of not feel like they worked in a bank and work somewhere cool and could be who they wanted to be that's very cool I love that and I think I mean bringing all of that creative together I mean as I said I think your creative is is a lot of your secret sauce but knowing that you've brought all of these creative agents together, I mean, what you guys can achieve together is, is so much better. So talk to me. It's interesting to me that when we met, I saw you with the video camera in hand and in part because of exactly what you say. I mean, your, your music background was all about kind of the anim anonymity of, you know, you're not seeing the face behind it. And I think where so many folks struggle with video is, putting their mug up on a video or on camera and what do they say and, and how to do it. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it was the stage that I met you at, but you've always seemed so comfortable doing it. Um, so t talk to me a little bit about kind of why, why'd you get started in video? Where was that opportunity that you really saw? So it was again, looking, it was looking for, for the white space. So I started doing video probably around, I don't know, maybe three or four years ago now. And I, when I initially set up my company, I set it up, you know, I, I was a new broker. There was no guidebook. I really didn't know what the hell I was doing. And, and I, I found for the first couple of years, I played within parameters that I thought I needed to play within. And then what happened was, uh, 
you compare PLG to, you know, Berkshire Hathaway to Keller Williams to all of these other companies, and there was differences, but it wasn't it wasn't necessarily as pronounced as, as I wanted it to be. You looked at all of our social, I mean, we were doing a lot of social media, but it was a lot of, you know, uh, it certainly wasn't vanilla, but it wasn't like in your face. Mm -hmm. And then I remember I was look, I knew that video, again, that little voice inside that I've always trusted said, Vid video is the next thing, video, video. And I was looking for a way to leap into video. And I just was not turned on by these, I saw a few little videos of these agents like talking about themselves and how cool the houses were and this and that. And I'm like, eh, it's not really kind of me. Mm -hmm. And then I heard Chris Smith speak at Inman, I think either the year I met you or the year before I met you. And he said, um, if you're looking to jump into video, talk about stuff that you know about your industry and just give away the information. And I'm like, Bingo. So that's where I leapt straight into Magic Minute, where I give away all the tips on, on mm -hmm. the industry, which I, st I still do now. And then I became, then I was off and running. I was obsessed. And then I started, you know, looking around, digging through the internet, digging through YouTube. I found Casey Neistat. I found Gary Vaynerchuk. I found lots of people who were putting out lots of stuff. And it was like learning to be a record producer all over again with video. Mm -hmm. uh, and I knew to my bones, and it's st and this is still the case, and it's not too late to anybody watching out there. I knew to my bones that as an individual boutique company, I'm not going to outspend Keller Williams. I'm not going to outspend Coal Banker. I'm not going to have more adverts in the paper than them. But I can run circles around all of them with my social media strategy, as long as it's authentic and real and entertaining and informational or infotainment. Mm -hmm. And that's what I set out to do. Yeah, I mean, I think like what you, what you have really accomplished in a really effective way is sort of this intersection between social media and video, where you're kind of doing what I call this social sell or this social storytelling thing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's so powerful. I mean, I recall vividly the first time that we met, um, my my wife who has a deep southern accent those of you that don't know and and pita pita's accent obviously and the two of them were just magnetically attracted to one another <laughs> and having so much fun and peter's capturing the whole thing on video and i'm thinking what is this guy possibly going to use this like he's just entertaining her by by letting her be on this video right now and then what you did in that segment is you put together a whole recap of the Inman event that we were at. And even the snippet of the two of you back and forth went on there. And I think to me, what that does is it tells the whole story of you attending things like this, or, I mean, video to me is so much more than like walking through a house oh, or, sure. you know, I mean, like to me, I don't even really put that in the same category as, as video anymore. So, in terms of you, a lot of what you do is sort of kind of this brokerage angled video where you're sharing tools and, and, and directed a lot of the time towards agents. So if, if there's a single agent or a team out there that's trying to really go straight to the consumer, what are some topics that you think or some strategies that you think they could really use effectively? Sure. And I, and I think the, the precursor to all this is um, you know, people come up to me and they say, oh, I wish I was so confident as you, as confident as you. And you're so, you're such a natural. And I'm like, you know, I mean, I have, every time I bring the camera up or now in the case of Netflix, when I have a camera in my face, I still have all those voices screaming at me saying, you're too old, you're too fat. Nobody can understand a word you're saying. You aren't talented. You should just give it up, mate. I, I go, I have the same demons as everyone else, but the difference is I just don't listen to them. Mm -hmm. So I'm now comfortable with the fact that um, my opinion of myself, this is getting deep, that my opinion of myself is not that great, right? When it comes to, 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 to talent, if you will. Right. Um, but that's okay. That's okay. And, and I, and I just kind of, so, so again, it's like, 
if that's if that's the bar for me, the only way to go is up, right? Mm-hmm. And so I'm amazed. I mean, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a little sidebar, right? When I was filming the show for Netflix, I didn't unpack until halfway through the second week because I thought they were going to send me home. <laughs> I'm on the set going, they're going to figure this out, right? They're going to figure it out. They're going to figure it out, and I'm, they're going to send me back. I love it. And then by the end of week two, I'm like, shit, looks like I'm staying. You're like, I guess I should hang up my shirt so I don't have to iron them every day. I love right. it. I love this. This is so important, though, because if you haven't seen Peter's videos, I really I encourage you guys to tune in. Because one of the things that you do that I, that I love that you do is they, they're really raw. They're high quality in terms of, like, the, the video picture and the audio. Like, that's all high quality. But you do something that a lot of people would edit out where you'll set up the camera and then you'll kind of see you walk around and sit down. And I love that because to me, it shows like this guy isn't just paying thousands of dollars to somebody to like come and video him and and put on like a Netflix sort of production. You're doing this. And I think to me, that makes it the, the story of it so much more powerful. Like I love that I watch you come around and push play and record. And I I think that makes it so real. Is that all intentional or is that just sort of like you started doing it and just kept on doing it? You know, it's interesting. I guess it's styles, right? I I have never, I've never really been a super slick guy. I'm always very, you know, keeping it real kind of. (laughs) Even in my my old age, I'm like, yeah, man, it's got to be streetwise. (laughs) <laughs> um, uh, and so I really, and the thing is this, am I allowed to swear on this? Not that I particularly. Yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I really, even though I'm very hard on myself, I have another uh, arrow in my quiver, which is, I really don't give a shit what, what I, I, I'm, my value, my self value is never based upon other people's opinions. Mm-hmm. So therefore I make the videos for me. And if I like them, I put them out. I'm not putting them out going, oh, I wonder if people are going to think that my shirt was creased or, oh, do I sound, you know, um, I wore the wrong shoes, damn it. You know, I, I, I don't give a toss. For me, it's all about the story and being raw and, and learning, like, you know, setting the camera going and walking around the table. I thought it looked really intimate and it was inviting people into the scene. Yeah. And I learned, that, I learned that from Casey Neistat. He does that all the time. It's one of his, that's how he enters his scenes a lot. And I'm like, I like that. I feel like I'm in the room with him. So I just that's used, awesome. that's what I used to do with records. I'd listen yeah. to records and I'd be like, ooh, I like the drums on this one. I like the bass line on this. I like her top line. And, and then you kind of mush it all together and create your own new record. Right, right. Um, so before I go to my next question, we have a question uh, from Lynn Johnson. Um, she asked about if there, for somebody that's doing video on Facebook, what would you say is the biggest key to growing your following on a different platform like YouTube? And so essentially, how do you go about taking your followers from Facebook to your YouTube channel and then spark that engagement over on that channel? It's really hard. So YouTube is, is my muse, right? I have been in love with YouTube for a long time. And I, I guess when it comes to real estate, right, there are certain platforms that, that, are, that are better. Like, and this is just my opinion, but Facebook feels <clears throat> in many ways more local and more intimate. Mm-hmm. Whereas YouTube is anonymous, right? It's massive, it's global. And so to try and export your community to YouTube, trust me, I've tried it. It's, it's, it's really hard, especially with Facebook. Because Facebook people are like, I want to be on Facebook. I don't want to go to YouTube. So I believe there is some white space right now on one of the platforms which I'm hammering, and that is Instagram TV. Mm -hmm. Instagram TV, I feel, is a massive opportunity for, uh, for us all right now. And I'm double, tripling down on it because as I thought you would be able to preview the long form video of Instagram TV in your main feed. I had a gut feeling that would be coming. I also feel 
that Instagram TV will be searchable before much longer. And once it's searchable through hashtags and keywords, which I'm sure it will be, that will really, really throw a, 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 you know, a dagger in the, in the heart of, of YouTube. So if you've got a community that's loyal to you on Facebook, I feel it's going to be a far easier transition to move them onto Instagram than it is to move them onto YouTube. That's just my two cents. No, that's a good, that's a good thought. Definitely. Um, so look like real estate changes by the hour, if not by the year. And so you've been in real estate is, excuse me, real estate now. Well, you've had your brokerage almost 10 years, nine years now, which I'm sure it's flown by. And one thing that I've always admired about you is just what you just did is you seem to kind of put your finger on the pulse and look ahead and not just be present in where you are right now, but where do you see those future opportunities? So besides for uh, Instagram TV, what are some other opportunities that you see kind of where people that really want to double down on some stuff? I see it. <clears throat> so you, I, this is the example I always use when I'm, um, when I'm, I'm chatting to my agents or, or other agents for that matter. I say, Real estate has turned into Star Wars. You can either be in the Imperial Army and just be another number, or you can be part of the rebellion. You can be on a, on a, on a battle cruiser, or you can be on the Millennial Falcon. <laughs> you choose. And for the indie community in the United States, there is a massive opportunity that only we have right now. And that will last for probably like the next 12 to 24 months. I'm deploying this in Los Angeles, which is, if in, by, by nature, indie brokerage's culture, I think seems to be stronger because it's smaller, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's a stronger, more tight-knit community. So to all the brokers out there who, are, who might be watching this or thinking about watching this, I have already rolled the dice for everyone so that they can follow in my footsteps if they want to. My Beverly Hills, uh, my big, beautiful 6,000 square foot Beverly Hills office um, that I, I had for years, last summer, which we were having an incredible summer. Again, I have this philosophy of get out on the top floor. Mm -hmm. you, we were tripping over deals as a company. Everybody was making money. So I decided to move my headquarters into WeWork. And I expected massive fallout from my agents. I expected 20 to 30% of them to leave. Wow. Zero, zero left. And I actually gained about another 30 agents. Um, and, and that was nerve wracking, but I knew it had to be done because the one thing that us Indies have is agility. So now that I've done it once, I am now opening little mini brokerages all around LA. So my presence has gone from one office to five and soon it will be six. Wow. So I have six offices in Los Angeles that are all based, not all but one of them are based in WeWork. And it, some agents, it, not at my company, but some agents at the more traditional companies like Sotheby's and Berkshire Hathaway doesn't compute. But the more progressive agents, especially the ones that are, I don't even want to say under 40 because I've got a lot of agents 50, 50 and above, but they are much more progressive and they realize that the wallpaper doesn't help them sell and that I help them sell. They, I could hold a meeting in a freaking cow shed and they would come. I love that. So for indie brokerages out there, Maybe because that's the drain on resources, right? When the market shifts, which it will next year, the drain on resources is where you're at. So if you can diversify uh, and, and get in a communal space, number one, you look really cool. Number two, you bring your overhead down. And number three it isn't to make money. It's to make sure that the message to your agents remains pure. That's why I did it. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's so important. And I, I think what you hit on too is for the agents that we have listening, not just the brokerages. I mean, you guys are even more agile <laughs> because if you decide today, Hey, I really want to, you know, go deep into Instagram TV or into YouTube or into whatever. 
All you actually have to do is go and do it. Um, And I think that's, there's such power in that. There's not that many industries that have the ability for you to be that agile. Um, So that's, that's extremely powerful what you're saying there, Peter. So we talk about delegation a whole lot. And obviously I talk a ton about time management and you um, said something a few weeks ago that I love that you posted it on Instagram, I believe, where somebody was asking you about your follow-up and you said one by one by one, I go and I do it. And to me, that's so powerful because most people oftentimes think, hey, I need to delegate some of this. I need to delegate my follow-up. And I'm super impressed that with all you have going on now, that you're still doing this personally. And this is not something that you delegate. And I, I can attest that he does in fact do that because I've communicated with Peter to book this and to have him come on the show and talk to him back and forth about this. So I know that you're doing this follow-up personally. So why do you think it is so important that that is not a task that we're delegating? And is it something that you will continue to do as long as you live or as long as you practice? That's a really interesting question. So again, what I always try and do is I don't necessarily always look for the shortcut. I look for the the best result. And and one thing that made me a really good uh, realtor, I think, was was empathy. I was able to put my mind, when I was working with a buyer or a seller, I could could literally detach my own wants and needs and, and purely immerse myself in what the client wanted. Uh, and, and it's really powerful when, when you really make the decision to not care about the commission and only care about the client. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and that kind of empathy allowed me to um, seek the highest and best results. So I know when I receive emails from people I know that are, hey, Peter, hope you are having a good day. Do you know about one, two, three dry cleaners on down the- I'm like, you know what, if, 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 you, if I am of no value personally to you, you are of no value personally to me. Mm. And so I prospect every single day myself. Um, I respond sometimes slowly, but I, I respond to all of my um, uh, social media personally. Um, up until recently, I was shooting, editing, doing the music, doing the graphics, doing the photos, doing the overlays, running a brokerage with 200 agents, and also my own book of business, which is anywhere from 50 to 100 deals a year. So it's, I, 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 I had a moment of clarity, because I'll take a lot on my shoulders, but I had a moment of clarity. I was sitting over my uh, edit, I, I have a studio in the house, and I was sitting over my editing computer at like one in the morning, and I had to be up again at five. And I'm like, what am I doing? This is kind of bonkers. And so I made the decision at that point to begin to have people help me with certain aspects of my business. For mm-hmm. example, I have, um, I now just hired, funny enough, a nomad. A nomad is someone who just has a laptop and has no home. And they travel from country to country. And he is now going to be helping me with my uh, social media marketing engines. He's going to be doing all the programming and the funnels and all that stuff. So that's a hire that I, I just did. I also hired someone to help me with some, some graphics, which is simple stuff, which has taken a load off my back. And then I also have hired someone who um, will take the social media and then drop it into the various posting engines because I was doing all that. Either me and and one other person were doing it all. And I found all of these people on Upwork. Mm -hmm. So I utilized Upwork. I have to tell you, it's a dream. Like my podcast, I would record it, do the intro, drop it into GarageBand, edit it, compress it, EQ it, put the beginning on, the end on, upload it, graphic, hashtags, da 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 Madness. Now I hired a guy through Upwork in Lisbon, Portugal. I sent him the audio file and he just constructs it for me, uploads it everywhere, does the copy and it's done. Well, and that's so powerful because to me, 
we kind of think about it in an old school way where when people were talking about hiring assistants or admins, you wanted somebody that was qualified to do all of this stuff. And unfortunately, the way that the business has evolved, the way social media has evolved, the way everything has evolved is most people don't have all of these skills anymore. It's very, very rare to find somebody that does. And if you do find that person, you probably can't afford to pay them what they're worth. And right. so, so using something like Upwork, I think is so valuable. I've used Upwork a few times for various things like editing and, and some social media stuff as well. And those people are just laser focused on something like graphics. And so you can literally just send them some images and say, this is what I want to do. This is what, what I'm trying to do. And they'll just send you a file with all of it. And you're yep. paying them. I mean, you're not paying them crazy amounts of money. And to me, that's such a better investment than, you know, overworking somebody else that really doesn't have that skill set. So I love the way you're utilizing that. Yeah. And, and I found, I found that, and, and I learned the hard way because I hired people and, and they were really good at copywriting, but then didn't really understand graphics and didn't really understand. And it was like very frustrating. They were on full-time salaries and, um, and it was expensive and I wasn't getting anything, what, anything that I wanted, very little of what I wanted. So now, like you say, it's, it's this shared economy, which just permeates everything where I now have this guy, he's probably 25 years old from Pittsburgh and he's going to be sitting on the beach, uh, doing my social media for a few hours a day. And he's, uh, and that's all he's doing. So he could be on the moon for all I care. Um, yeah. and, and, and I only pay for these people like the, the, the graphics person, you know, I maybe pay for three to four hours a week as opposed to, you know, and it's so far, far more efficient. And then that frees up my time so that I can spend it with my agents. Yeah. And I mean, I, I, th I think that's, to me, that is kind of the essence of everything we're talking about is if you're not hiring somebody that is an expert at what you're hiring them to do, you're not only paying them to do what you're asking, you're paying them to learn how to do what you're asking, probably not put out a great product and your feedback. You're paying for all of that time versus yeah. somebody that's an expert. You're just paying for those three to four hours, if even that. Um, that you're doing. So I think that is something that is definitely a takeaway. So, I mean, I can't have a big Netflix star on the show without asking. So Peter, you had a Netflix show called Stay Here that premiered, I believe last fall. Um, and I'm curious because you've done so much video, what are some things that you learned from that experience, whether it be, you know, marketing sort of stuff or, you know, what, what did you take away from that? I mean, I don't think most people on here want to be on TV or, or that really is a dream of a lot of agents. But I think that being in that setting, there's so much to be learned from. And I, I know you well enough to know that you don't go pretty much anywhere without kind of trying to absorb things around you. Yeah, I mean, what I learned, see, it, it was very interesting because in, in a strange way, it was almost familiar to me because it reminded me of being around creatives when I used to do records. And so it was, I tell you, I'll tell you one story that was, that was uh, a little bit terrifying. So the first day, I'm in uh, Washington, D.C., right? <clears throat> it's the first day of shooting. Right, I got through all, all again, the auditions. I, I remember rolling up thinking, well, they, they, there's no way this is going to happen. They're never going to pick me. And I'd never auditioned for anything. They reached out to me. They found my videos on YouTube and they said, would you like to host a show on Netflix? I'm like, what? And because there's a lot of agents in LA that try out for TV shows all the time and I never had. Um, and, uh, and I tried out for it and I'm like, oh, there's this line of good looking guys. And I'm like, okay, great. This is a giggle. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, I went away and they said, yeah, congratulations. You got the show. And, uh, and then we did a few months of pre-production talking about the properties that we were going to do and, you know, coming up with ideas for them. And then the first day of shooting, cause we didn't have any rehearsals, right? The first day of shooting, I'm on the, I'm on the set, if you will, in, in Washington, D.C. And my adrenaline's pumping because I'm used to doing this with my camera, right? I'm used to this, but now there's six cameras and friggin' lighting guys and wardrobe makeup. And then there's guys with chainsaws and, 
you know, building crews, fire marshals. I mean, it was like being in the train station. It was so busy. And, and the producer keeps looking over at me and going, Pete, you good? You good? I'm like, yeah, yeah, great, mate. Yeah. <laughs> in my mind, I'm thinking he's going to be saying, um, they're going to come over and say, right, Pete, we're talking about, you know, ripping out the kitchen and, and we're going to be doing, you know, putting in a new kitchen. If you could just talk about like the benefit of that. I thought there was going to be some, some kind of coaching. Anyway, so I'm on full adrenaline rush all day. And then about four hours in, he looks at me and he goes, you good, Pete? I'm like, yeah. He's like, action. And I'm like, action what? Action what? what? And he's like, you're a professional. Profess. So I'm like, here we go. Sink or swim. Okay. So we're in the kitchen. We're moving out the cabinets. They're bringing in the fireplace through the old Victorian window. This is going to definitely increase the value on this property. And the paint colors Genevieve has chosen are absolutely amazing and complement everything to do with the traditional nature of this Victorian firehouse. Cut. And I'm like, and then, <laughs> and then like, 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 a, like a plague of locusts, they just moved on to the next scene. I was hoping someone was going to go, great job, awesome. No, nothing. But that's just how it rolled. And so what I learned from it was television's really hard and it's really long hours. Um, and it's very, very complex and complicated. And I, I have learned that I love it and there's going to be more TV coming. I've got uh, two or three things in the works right now. And of course, season two of Stay Here. Um, um, but also I have realized that real estate for all of us that have been in it a while and make a good living, it's a tough industry to leave because you make great money in real estate. The amount of people on the TV crew that came up to me and went, you know, I've been thinking about getting into real estate. I'm like, wow, this is wild. <laughs> so, you know. I hope I give you an answer. No, I think honestly, <laughs> I mean, that to me, one, that's a fantastic story. <laughs> I love that story. I, I don't know that you've told me that yet. But two, I love that line of you're the professor, profess, because it's so true. We get so wrapped up in what are we going to say? How am I going to look? What am I going to do? And the reality is we've got it up here. We know what we know, and that's, that's the value we can provide to agents, brokerages, clients, whoever it may be. And, you know, agents come to me all the time and they say, you know, what should I blog about? What should I record videos about? What should I do all these things about? And, and I say, just answer questions. That's the easiest place to start. So I think that that's such valuable advice, and I, I love that takeaway. Well, Pete... Thank you so much for joining us. This has been an absolute pleasure. You're such a joy to talk to. Um, my wife just sent me a text message and said I could listen to him all day. Um, so <laughs> I, I could as well. Um, but I think, I, you know, you, you have such value and you do so much for our industry. You guys, if you have not checked out Peter's videos, please do. He gives so much value um, between, you know, your Monday mantra or you know your takeaways are all, all and they're all short form videos that are really powerful so um if somebody wants to find you whether it be facebook instagram wherever where could they find you pete just search peter lorimer and i will pop up at peter lorimer is pretty much all of my handles peter lorimer official on youtube peter lorimer official on facebook page awesome well thank you again it is such a pleasure to have you you're such a joy I hope I get to see you before too long. And you guys, I will see you uh, next month. Next month, our guest is Michelle Humes, who runs the Humes Group out of Peachtree City, um, Georgia, or excuse me, Florida. Um, she, uh, two years ago, was an incredibly successful agent selling $20 million a year by herself with an admin. And in just two years, she has like tripled that and has a team of 15 people um, and is just absolutely slaying it. So she's going to talk to us about how to scale your business, how to grow your business. And she will be live with us um, as our April guest. That event is going to drop in the Facebook today um, and you will start to see it. So I will see you guys next month. Thanks again, Pete. I'll see you guys soon. Bye guys. <laughs>